Thank you all very much. President Stevens, Speaker Chenault, members of the House and Senate, and friends across Alaska. It is my honor to join you again for my second presentation to the legislature as Alaska's newest U.S. Senator. Having members of Congress report to the public in this forum is fairly unique among my colleagues. When I tell my colleagues that I'm addressing a joint session of the legislature, honestly, I receive mixed congratulations and condolences. <laughs> but I know you'll be easy on me. I'm especially thankful to be here after surviving the great Washington blizzard of 2010. The 50 plus inches of snow we got over four days shut down the East Coast and brought the federal government to a halt. But I'm pleased to say <laughs> some of us were applauding also. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that hardy Alaskans in my office and Senator Murkowski's office braved the elements to report to work every single day. And I'll, I'll tell you the snow drivers or the snowplow drivers from any community in Alaska truly could teach a thing or two to the folks in Washington, D.C. Today I want to detail to the legislature and our shared constituency what we're doing in Washington to try to improve the lives and livelihood of Alaskans. Because of the unprecedented challenges facing our state and nation, I believe it's more vital than ever before that we work in partnership to address those challenges. Speaking of partnerships, let me address up front Alaska's relationship with the federal government. Recently, many of us got a great laugh from Julia O'Malley's column on the subject, appropriately headlined, quote, Dear Feds, Feds, we loathe you. Please send us money. <laughs> I'm not usually in the business of handing out comments to the media, but Julia wasn't far off the mark. It seems like about once a week I get a letter or a press release or even a threatened lawsuit, many from the third floor of this building, taking the federal government to task for, for, the evil under, for their evil undertaking. I appreciate that beating up on the feds is good politics. I've done it myself, and it does create good headlines. And a lot of times, they deserve it. From Anwar to Second Amendment rights to Obama administration, and many in Congress are simply wrong and need to be told so in uncertain terms. At the same time, the federal government is a vital partner to Alaska in, in the form of both essential services and, yes, in the bucks we bring home. According to the state's own Department of Revenue, the federal government spent almost $11 billion in Alaska in federal spending in the year fiscal year 08. That includes benefits for the military servicemen and women who we cherish so much in our state, retirement and disability payments to our seniors, and health care to about half our population through Defense Department, the VA, Indian Health Services, and Medicare. That healthy payout ranks Alaska third of all 50 states in per person federal spending. For every dollar Alaska sends to Uncle Sam in federal taxes, we get back nearly $2 in return. Not a bad deal. It gets even better when it comes to the gasoline tax. Since the time of Dwight Eisenhower was president, Alaska has received more than $6 for every dollar in federal tax dollars. This underwrites the cost of road construction and maintenance in our state. I know as you put your final touches on this year's budget, nearly $2 billion comes from the federal government. It will receive over the next years for essential services like road services, Medicaid payments, school assistance. That makes up almost a fourth of your $8 billion operating budget. In addition to this routine federal funding, Alaska received the biggest single federal payout in memory last year with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, this historic legislation delivering about $1.6 billion to our state and creating and protecting upwards to 8,000 Alaskan jobs. And I was proud to be one of the critical votes to put it over the top. The federal government is more than a cash machine. We're also getting results on Alaska needs by working with the new administration and building important relationships across the political aisles of Congress. Let me highlight just a few of the examples. 
After years of lawsuits, sloppy work by previous administration, the Interior Department approved Shell's exploration plans for oil and gas development off Alaska's northern coast. The EPA also granted its draft air permit for jobs for this job creating project. In just 14 months in office, the President has dispatched more than seven department heads, cabinet heads here to Alaska to see firsthand Alaska's needs. After 17 years, I helped persuade Congress to approve a permanent reauthorization to the Indian Health Services Act and Health Care Reform Bill, which modernizes the nation's commitment to health care for thousands of Alaska Natives, and I was the only member of our delegation to vote for it. After 20 years of struggle, the Obama administration, EPA gave the green light to the Kensington Mine, which will create over 250 jobs right here in Juneau. After, after 36 years, the federal government has commissioned a sorely needed research vessel for which the University of Alaska will operate. And this morning, the President announced, just as we came in here, President Obama announced and gave the green light to OCS development for the existing leases on Beaufort and Chukchi Sea. Both Senator Murkowski and I have put out a press release today applauding this effort as the right move to develop our leases that we manage and manage them well, and we can prove this throughout the rest of the country. Another good step. The list is long of the fruits of the federal government's relationship with Alaska. I'll continue to work with the Obama administration and members of Congress from both sides of the aisle to produce results for our state. The area we've been focused on mostly is helping millions of Americans who are hurting from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Thankfully, Alaska has been spared from the worst of it. But still, last month, the unemployment rate at 8.5 percent is the highest in almost two decades. Among the approximately 1,000 letters and emails I receive every single week, heartbreaking stories from Alaskans about their struggle to keep their families afloat in these tough times. That's why Congress recently passed the first of several jobs bills to put Americans back to work. The HIRE Act, designed to help small businesses expand, hire workers, and jumpstart the infrastructure projects, including many in Alaska. Together with the recovery bill, thousands of Alaskans are going to work on projects from the Nome Hospital, the new Nome Hospital in Senator Olson's and Representative Foster's district, to the new causeway scheduled for completion this summer in Senator Kukish and Representative Thomas's area. And I commend the legislature and the local government leaders across the state for helping make this Recovery Act be productive in ways that benefit so many Alaskans. I thank you for the courage and the resolve for making it possible for Alaskans to go back to work. Another issue I know is on the minds of small business owners, the individual and individual Alaskans, health care. A recent Anchorage Economic Development Corporation survey found 58 percent of the Anchorage businesses rank the highest cost of health insurance as the significant barrier to expanding and growing their businesses for the future. Over 100,000 of our fellow Alaskans risk their economic and personal health by living without insurance because they can't afford it. The historic health insurance reform le legislation the President signed into law saves lives, saves money, saves Medicare, and holds insurance companies accountable. I voted for this new law because Alaskans will see numerous and immediate benefits from the health insurance reform. There is help for small businesses right now, immediately. Small businesses with fewer than 10 workers get a tax credit for a portion of what they spend now on health insurance to help provide coverage for their employees. As the law ramps up, more tax credits become available. There's help for Alaskans with pre-existing conditions within three months. People with pre-existing conditions who have had their insurance canceled from insurance companies will get help. There's also help for dependent children. Within six months, parents, health insurance will cover the dependent child up to the age of 26. There's help for seniors. Those in the donut hole, something that many of us had no idea what the donut hole was until we more and debated this issue over the last year. They will receive a $250 rebate this year, but eventually the donut hole will be closed completely, saving Alaska seniors on their prescription drugs every single year two to four thousand dollars each. Real hard savings. Within 
Within six months, all insurance plans must provide free checkups, including seniors on Medicare. There's help for Alaskans who can't afford health insurance today. More than 40,000 Alaskans will become newly eligible for basic health care coverage under Medicaid. The federal government will pay 100% of the price tag for the first three years and 90% thereafter permanently. Some of this call it unfunded mandate. I think providing tens of thousands of Alaskans health coverage at a cost to the state of 10 cents on the dollar is a pretty good deal. I've also included very specific Alaska provisions in the health care reform bill. These include increased loan forgiveness for new primary care providers, added Medicare funding for community hospitals, and a focus on improving health care for more than 340,000 Alaskans who get their coverage from the federal government. I also helped write the cost containment amendment that cuts prices to consumers, increases value, innovation in the health care system, and literally saves hundreds of millions of dollars. I appreciate there are many Alaskans, including many of you in this room, who are skeptical about the new health care reform law. Unfortunately, there has been too much misinformation and not enough focus on the details. That's why I'm confident, as Alaskans and Americans everywhere learn more about health reform, its cost savings and enormous benefits will become part of the fabric of this country. Just like equally controversial landmark legislation from years gone by, Social Security and Medicare, I believe as people see the details, they will see the benefit to everyone in this country and in this great state of ours. Like you, I'm deeply troubled by the enormous level of the red ink facing the future generations in the form of the federal deficit and the federal debt. In fact, that's one reason why I voted for the health care bill. Very simply put, it reduces the federal deficit in the first 10 years by $143 billion. The next 10 years, over $1.2 trillion, the largest single deficit reduction legislation this Congress or any previous Congress over the last few years has ever passed. And those are not my numbers. Those are from the bipartisan Congressional Budget Office. Today, unprecedented $13 trillion debt didn't suddenly appear last year by this administration. It's the results of years of failing to pay for two wars, tax cuts for the wealthy, and recent spending to prevent the economy from tailspinning into a depression. Everyone's at fault, Democrats and Republicans. But we are here. We have been dealt a deck of cards, and we must resolve it to move this country forward. I'm actively working on this painful and long-term changes necessary to reduce the federal debt. That's why I joined the Budget Deficit Caucus and have been recently appointed to the Budget Committee of the United States Senate. It's why I'm supported legislation creating the Debt Commission to force congressional budget reductions and why I helped pass PAYGO legislation requires Congress to pay for the legislation as you move forward. It's also why I joined just a few handful of Democrats joining a group of Republicans to say any money paid back from the TARP money or surplus not spent by the TARP money must go to pay the national debt. Well, state and federal government investments in Alaska are enormously important. I know everyone in this room agrees that it's the private sector that leads the way in job creation. Government's role should be to help create pro-business climate and then get out of the way. We've been fighting to do exactly that when it comes to Alaska resource development. From the new OCS oil and gas exploration in Kensington Mine, from responsible tim timber harvesting in Southeast, and fighting for development in Anwar and NPRA on the North Slope, we're fighting for Alaska's right to develop its abundant natural resources. Let me commend the members of this legislature for your intense, and I put that with underline, intense focus this session on the Alaska natural, nat natural gas pipeline. I agree with those who believe it should be the private sector sponsors of the gas line, not politicians, which determine the best project to deliver to Alaska's enormous gas reserves to market. And I also agree that any gas line must address the in-state needs for Alaska consumers and Alaska businesses. We're working to do our part in Washington, and I was pleased the Senate recently unanimously confirmed my recommendation of Larry Persley as a new federal gas pipeline coordinator. I don't know what Mike Hawker is thinking of me today, uh, but I hope he'll continue to speak to me um, in years to come. 
But as you have seen, as I mentioned earlier on the OCS announcement that we had today, we are working aggressively with the administration to move these projects forward. And as the OCS has made it to the national highlight for Alaska in the sense of a positive development today, soon you can expect new demonstration of support by the Obama administration for the Alaska gas line project and we're po poised to ready to increase loan guarantees and federal support for this vital national project. There also is progress on many other fronts for the business sectors important to Alaska. Recent, recent reauthorization of the FAA bill, which nationally is about 150,000 new employees in the sense of the development around the FAA bill. It's truly a jobs bill, including some amendments we put in. For those in rural Alaska, including a special amendment exempting Alaska from the rule which threatened rural Alaskans access to compressed oxygen necessary for medical treatment and construction purposes. The FAA reauthorization also makes significant investments in Alaska's airport infrastructure and greatly improve the aviation safety by modernization of our air traffic control system. The technology in the heart of the system, next gen modernization, was proven right here in Alaska under the Capstone program. I know each of you are happy to know that FAA just a few weeks ago installed a new, new cutting edge technology on tracking system here at the Juneau Airport, one of only two in the nation but right here in our city. With one of my Republican colleagues, Nebraska Senator Mike Johans, I recently formed the first ever Senate General Aviation Caucus to work with pilots, aircraft owners, and aviation industry and government agencies for this important sector of our economy. It's a job creator, and for Alaska, it's also life and death. And I noticed as I was walking through the hall, many people are here from the tourism industry, and I want to give a little comment on that. As the tourism industry suffers from international recession and domestic recession, we passed the Travel Promotion Act last month. It will help generate jobs in Alaska's visitor industry. This national public-private partnership is focused on bringing more high-spending overseas travelers to America without one penny of federal tax dollars. Alaska fisheries continue to be a major part of Alaska's economy, as you all know, and a driver of many of our coastal communities. I'm working to keep the harvest strong, healthy and sustainable by supporting research needed by federal and state biologists to ensure that the decisions affecting our fisheries are based on the best available science. I believe that the science is on our side. And we want to make sure that the decisions affecting fisheries, whether on, cooking, on the Cook Inland Belugas or the stellar sea lions, are based on the best and scientifically valid research. In January, we were able to persuade Commerce Secretary Gary Locke to declare a fisheries disaster for the Yukon River. Because of the low salmon runs, there has been no commercial Chinook fishing on the river for the past two seasons. Even subsistence fisheries have been harmed dramatically. I'm on the side of the fisheries families who are hurting because of these poor runs. Senator Murkowski and I are working together to now fund that disaster declarations. It will be an upcoming battle but one will be anxious to fight. I'm also keeping a close eye on the Coast Guard. That they seek to tighten their budget, they don't pare back here on the mission vital to Alaska, such as search and rescue, fishery patrols, and port security. Recently, we met with the Coast Guard to make sure our position and our conditions are very, very clear to them. Alaska has garnered national media attention this year, a lot of it because of climate change. As every Alaskan knows, we're on the cutting edge when it comes to experiencing the impacts, coastal erosion, undercutting our villages, warming permafrost, thawing Arctic sea ice, changing fish and animal migration patterns. That's why the first legislation that I introduced was seven bills focused on the issue of the Arctic and climate change. These bills are designed to help Alaska adapt to these climate change with re more research, community assistance through revenue sharing, strengthen Coast Guard presence, new icebreakers, and stronger diplomacy. Because Alaska is America's only Arctic state, I'm pleased to announce today that I've been able to convince the Senate Commerce Committee to hold Arctic field hearings here in Alaska this year. My fellow senators need and want to hear directly from Alaskans, and need to, to understand what our impacts are and what our concerns are when it comes to the issues of the Arctic. I'll also invite experts, Alaska experts, 
to both detail the challenges and the opportunities of climate change that present to our state, including resource development, new shipping lanes, and even new tourism potential. When it comes to understanding our changing world and preparing young Alaskans to meet the challenges it presents, there's nothing more important than education. I commend this legislature for your generous investment into Alaska schools and for your efforts to forward fund education. You have done a heck of a job. Alaska is fortunate to have great teachers, excellent schools, but what is especially troubling is our persistently low graduation rate. With a third of our students failing to graduate from high school, the earning gap between high school dropout and high school graduates is about 10,000 a year. A huge difference over a lifetime. Dropouts just from the class of 2008 will cost Alaska $1 billion in lost wages over their lifetime. That's why I support the President's Race to the Top initiative. This innovative approach is designed to encourage and reward states rather than penalize states for making dramatic education reform. Unfortunately, our former governor declined to apply for this additional funding in the first round, forcing us in the company of only one other state, Texas. I've encouraged Governor Parnell to reconsider for the second round of funding, which could mean for Alaska $75 million to help turn around low-achieving schools, retain teachers and principals, enhance English as a second language, and focus on student learning. He recently wrote me expressing reservations about the initiative. Like the governor, I'm a strong believer in independence of our local school districts. But I also believe that Alaska must capitalize on every opportunity to bring resources to bear on young Alaskans to get them fully prepared to meet the rapidly changing world and the economic times we live in. Let's help fulfill the national goal that by 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. One way of ensuring this is making student loans are more affordable. That's exactly what we did in our student loan reform legislation, placing the needs of students ahead of private banks and eliminating the middleman between students and lenders. As the former chair of the Alaska Student Loan Corporation, I have a lot of history and, and credentials on this issue. I fought to preserve the integrity of our nonprofit lender. The reform I voted for means a thousand more Alaskan students will be eligible and our students will receive a hundred and three million dollars in the coming decade, a forty four million dollar increase. As we start the reauthorization of elementary and secondary education, formerly known as the No Child Left Behind Act, I'll continue to fight for Alaska and especially for rural schools so our children can compete on a national and global level. When I was Anchorage's mayor, legislators like Johnny Ellis and Kevin Meyer and Representative Hawker and many of you partnered with us to make our community a safer place. Our efforts helped drive down the crime rate to a 28-year low. As your senator, I continue to work on the issues of public safety. The Recovery Act that we passed earlier last year included $5 million dedicated to hiring cops or public safety officers across the state, including about half that went to Anchorage, another $2.6 million in combating sexual assault, domestic violence in Anchorage, Fairbanks, Bethel, and many other communities across the state. I was pleased that the Senate recently unanimously confirmed my recommendation of the former Anchorage Police Chief, Rob Hume, as the new U.S. Marshal. Despite these efforts, there is much more we must do. Legislators like Senator Hoffman and Representative Jewell know all too well the unacceptable statistics plaguing rural Alaska, disproportionately high rates of suicide, sexual assault, alcohol, and substance abuse. I certainly commend the efforts underway across the state today to focus on these crimes. The state of Alaska has tried to address these problems with village public safety officers and many other initiatives, but we must do more. That's why when I return to Washington in the next week, I'll be introducing the Alaska Safe Families and Village Act. My bill recognizes the tribes and tribal courts like those in Sitka and Cake, who have successfully tackled these challenges and provided them with federal resources through a series of demonstration projects. I will admit the state administration is a little bit lukewarm on this bill, and frankly, what we're doing right now isn't working. We must look to new innovative approaches to deal with these issues, and we should look everywhere possible, and that's what we're going to do with this legislation. One of my greatest 
privileges in Alaska as the Alaska Center is making sure the federal government keeps its promises to our active duty servicemen and women and veterans. With 30,000 active duty military members and more veterans per capita than any other state, that's why I thought or, and fought for the position to be on Veterans and Armed Services Committee. Last spring in Afghanistan, to, I left Afghanistan to check our troops, including Alaskans. As you know, the 425 Striker Brigade, the Spartans, recently returned. While we're here, let's give them just a round of applause for the great work they did defending our country. I expect to return to Afghanistan later this fall to make sure the resources we're sending from the federal government are doing the job that the troops need. I'm also working to make sure we take care of them while they're home. I was pleased to secure a well-deserved pay raise for all service members, more than recommended by the Obama administration. Just last week, we introduced additional legislation to help create and ease the financial burden for members when they are transferred from the lower 48 to bases in Alaska and Hawaii and Guam. Working with Senator Murkowski, we also secured more than $300 million for Alaska's military installation to improve the quality of life for our military members with new housing and other facilities. I've also been working with the Department of Defense to permanently allow for higher reimbursement rates for TRICARE providers in Alaska. This will ensure that program is better served our active duty, our dependents, and retirees who utilize TRICARE as their means of insurance. Thanks to this legislature for working with us on the permanent fix to restore the retirement benefits for more than two dozen surviving members of the Alaska Territorial Guard who so bravely defended our country in World War II. Thank you for doing that. You know, I, I have to say, it's been a year since I was last here. I, I feel like it's almost been 10 years, uh, the amount of work we have done. And reflecting on the enormous opportunities and challenges we faced in the last year, I'm reminded of the words of Mark Twain. Do the right thing, he said. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. I've certainly astonished my share of Alaskans this year while making some tough decisions. And I thought we were, were the right ones to move this country forward. Those of us in public office should do no less. It is always a great honor to be here in front of the legislature. Thank you for the work you do every single day to make this state a better place. God bless you, God bless our country, and God bless the great state of Alaska.